Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. We are with James Ray Ginato today. He is obviously a very well-known journalist. He is a, a writer and um, he just published in the United States and in um, the UK a new book, which is about the Getty family, right, ultimately. The particular thing of this book is that you talk, James, about the famous John Paul Getty, right, the Mm -hmm. founder of the Mm -hmm. dynasty, which, by the way, was not really the founder because he had parents. And then you go chapter after chapter. Once you finish to talk about him, you talk about his children, grandchildren, and what different destinies they have, right? And right. They make... mm-hmm. Why did you write this book? You know, over the course of my magazine career, you know, I've been a writer for Vanity Fair for about the last 15 years. And I think for about 15 years before that, I was a features on a great W magazine. And over the years, the decades, you know, I interviewed a number of members of the Getty family. And I'd always found them quite interesting. And there was a certain mystique about them, a certain glamour. I'd also had interviewed a lot of people who were close to them, sort of in their orbit. And um, there was something kind of, I always found almost magnetic about the Getty family, just when when I spoke to people. And they, they seemed to um, associate with so many interesting people. Like I realized some of the most interesting people that I'd interviewed were somehow connected to them or friends of theirs. But the actual idea for the book came two or three years ago when I was talking to my editor. This is the woman who she'd been my longtime editor at Vanity Fair. Her name is Amy Bell. And then she went to Simon and Schuster to edit books. And we were having a lunch and she um, just suggested the, the Getty family to me as a possible subject. And kind of a light bulb went off and I said, well, that should be interesting. And a bit naively, though, I kind of thought it might be, I don't want to say easy, but you know, I had pretty good success getting members of the family to uh, give me interviews uh, for magazine stories. Also, I thought I had a fairly good sense of what the family was. When I started working on the book, it was, I realized the family was much more sprawling and complicated than I thought. When I started this, I thought maybe this is something, I, a book I could do in a year. It ended up taking about three years. Because as I said, just the family was much well, more sprawling, because, much more complicated. This is because you have a lot of different information. I mean, you start the book, I mean, the first part of the book is about this very odd and special man, John Paul Getty, who is very different from the millionaires or billionaires or trillionaires of today, right? right? As a person, you know, he doesn't wear a t-shirt and jeans, but he's a double-breasted, old-fashioned man. Exactly. But as well as this new young billionaires, he became a millionaire very early in his life. That's correct. Right? That's correct. I mean, so tell us about this very interesting character, you know, who was uh, then made this family, which is one of, we would say, of the American aristocracy, you know, like uh, the Rockefellers yeah. or the Beatles Dukes or yeah. the, the DuPont or the Mellons yeah. became one of these. But before that, tell us the story. What do you think is particularly interesting in your book about this very peculiar and uh, eccentric Man. Yeah, as you alluded to before, I mean, when he was born, his family were, were quite poor, but, you know, their family circumstances changed dramatically when J. Paul Getty was about 10 years old and his father, who had become a lawyer, struck oil himself. So J. Paul Getty, about that time in his teenage years, kind of had a leg up. But one of the interesting things about him, I think, is, you know, he used, in terms of how he made his fortune, the oil business. It was a combination of very good instincts, but also science. I mean, a lot of wildcatters at that time, you know, the expression of, were very much these hard-nosed kind of all independent men. And they prided themselves on going by their gut. J. Paul Getty studied the science of petroleum geology, which was then a pretty new science. And and a lot of kind of these old-time oil prospector kind of sneered at the idea that some bookworm could tell them where to prospect for oil. 
the Jay Paul Getty thought there was something to this. And that's and how he really made his the big, big fortune was in this area called the neutral zone between Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And it was a, a barren track that no one thought was worth anything. And, uh, and that's how he really made his billions. One of the other things I think interesting about J. Paul Getty and his family, including his parents, from the start, they had a very international outlook, even though you know his parents, they were born in basically Minneapolis and they moved to the West Coast. You know, the family around 1900, they undertook like three different, very long kind of grand tours of Europe with J. Paul Getty. So, you know, during his teenage years and for a, a family on the, the West Coast at that time, even a wealthy family, I think it was unusual to have that kind of interest in Europe and European culture. But they really felt that, you know, European culture and art was kind of a, kind of a beacon to them. And that's how I think J. Paul Getty um, worldview kind of formed. And in fact, you know, he criticized almost as soon as he could then. He began traveling and spending like that half the year in Europe because he wrote that he felt that America at the time was isolationist. He had a much kind of larger worldview. And that was in contrast to a lot of his peers, especially kind of the oil men of his time. And I, I quote one of them, Sid Richardson, I think. He said, I don't want to go nowhere outside Texas. And that was kind of the worldview of a lot of his peers. But J. Paul Getty, from the start, wanted to see the world. And uh, he wanted to, um, but especially Europe. He was very drawn to Europe. There are three things that I noticed in his early age is that, first of all, he had a very close relationship with his parents, with his father, and then with his mother, especially. Very, very. And the family trust, which still exists today, right. has his mother, if I'm not oh, wrong. That's right. The other thing, he's a kind of guy who was able to challenge J.D. Rockefeller. That's right. And he was not very well known. And the exactly. third thing, that he was a womanizer. He had yep. many wives and many love right. affairs. And this, strangely, bothered his parents. This wasn't really something they liked very much. That's true. It's his parents were very strict people. I mean, they started off as, as Methodists. So the father later converted to Christian science, but they were, were, were kind of brought up as Methodists. And, you know, and even though they were extremely close, one thing that is interesting, they never were physically affectionate towards each other. I think that's hard to maybe analyze that for whatever reason, but they were, they loved each other greatly. And when, when they died, you know, J. Paul Getty was very broken up about that. But yet, you're right, his father was upset about his womanizing. And um, he kept on getting married. And he had many children, wives. You know, what kind of a man he is? There are two parts in the book. The right. first is right. when he still in America. He's a friend of some American billionaires, like the Hearst. Right. And then at a certain point after the war, he decides to live in Europe because he was afraid of flying. Yeah, the fear of flying was a part of what kept him from America. But you're right. It's 1951. He sails to Europe, never came back for the rest of his life, especially this incredible museum that he built all remotely. You know, he never set foot in before he died. But in terms of his marriages, clearly he loved falling in love, but being married was a whole different thing. I think he felt trapped in these marriages. And, and all the marriages were pretty much very short-lived. What I think is so interesting, and I do bring this out in the book, after there was obviously some animosity, you know, that's always acrimony that surrounds any divorce, but he and his ex-wives, incredibly affectionate their entire lives. I mean, these women, they would come visit him at Sutton Place, they would write, they would call each other. And that kind of went for his mistresses too. He remained on very warm terms to the end of his days with all of his ex-wives. Another odd thing is that he, for many, many years, when he left the wife or she left him, yeah. he stayed with his parents. Yeah, it's true. And for many yeah. years, he lived in hotels. Yeah. And in the last decades of his life, yeah. he buys a big estate and uh, this huge house. Yeah. yeah. When he bought in Sutton Place, I think he was about 65. And so that was really the first permanent home he'd had since he was a teenager. You know, he was married and he set up homes for his wives and his children. He was rarely there. He was usually always on the road living out of hotel suites. So I think it's interesting, but finally, you know, he, when he's 65, he more or less settled down. 
you describe him as um, a womanizer, billionaire. Yeah. He liked animals. He had yes. from yeah. dog to wild animals in yeah. his estate. Lions, lions. yeah, he, he loved lions, yeah. But he was also a very hard worker. Oh, absolutely. No, he was a, a workaholic. He had also strange hours. I, I write about in the book, you know, he was kind of, yeah. a, kind of a no, nocturnal creature, you know. He was at the same time, though, very social. I mean, that's one, one of the, the myths about him, that he was kind of reclusive. He wasn't. I mean, he loved people. When he lived in London, he was often to dinners every night, and then they would go dancing at Annabelle's until, or wherever it was, until two or three in the morning. But then he would come back to Sutton Place, and like from two in the morning to like four in the morning, maybe he would stay up calling Saudi Arabia because it was, you know, daylight there and making calls. And there were also some charming stories. One of my favorite stories I, uh, I write about in the book is, you know, the curators from the Getty Museum, which hadn't even opened yet, you know, were coming over with making kind of embassies with uh, photographs of the treasures they wanted him to buy. You know, one of the curators told me a great story, like she would arrive at certain place at three in the morning, Bully Moore, the butler, would knock on her door and said, Mr. Getty will see you now. So, and then it was her time to go on and, you know, present these pictures. And then sometimes she said if he was in a good mood, he would ask her to crawl, to inspect his oriental carpets in the long gallery. You know, at four in the morning, they'd have to get on their hands and knees and examine the threads on this uh, the oriental carpet, which, you know, Jay Paul Getty thought was great fun. But I think he would finally get to sleep around five in the morning. He would wake up around 10, sometimes have breakfast and lunch together, work through the entire day. And then have a little walk. He was very into physical fitness, though. He liked lifting weights. So sometimes at the end of the afternoon, he would lift weights, take a walk, and then, you know, dinner, but then go right back to work. And then there is a legend that he was very stingy in a way. He was very careful with the money, right? That's true. And uh, he had the phone, his house phones. You had to put coins in the phone if you were a guest. Because he didn't want to pay for your phone calls, right? Yeah. The point about it being a cheap, that is absolutely true. There are some myths that are correct and some that are incorrect. That's a true myth. He was a, a tightwad, as we say. The one thing that I'd say about the pay phone, there's an interesting story I found from, I spoke to a woman named Rabina Lund, who had been a legal advisor and frankly was a, a longtime mistress of his. And she told me that actually the pay phone was her idea although Getty clearly thought it was a great idea and went with it. There was a phrase he said he installed it for the convenience of his guests because uh, he said uh, he was trying to think of them. He said, you know, if you're staying with a host, it's rather daunting if you want to place a, a long-distance call. Of course, long-distance calls were expensive at that time, but nonetheless, I mean, he could have afforded it clearly. In the same time, this man who was the only son, very attached to his mother, he had uh, several children, boys. Right. From your book, it comes out that he was, or he became more and more like a family man, too. I mean, he was interested yeah. in his family. Yeah. Even if the family, I wouldn't say they misbehave, but I mean, they are very different from him. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think it is true to say that his boys were young. He was a completely absent father. I mean, I think until they were like, well into their teenage years, they rarely saw him. Pretty most of them were off in California being raised by their respective mothers. But when they became adults, coincidentally, maybe you could have helped him in the business, then he sort of got interested in their lives. But then going forward, he became a very doting grandfather. I mean, he very much adored his grandchildren. If you go through his diaries, which I did, He's always making references to um, how much he adores his grandchildren and their visits. And, you know, I did speak to a number of his grandchildren, and that affection was returned. I mean, his grandchildren all um, spoke of him very warmly. And like I said, later in life, he developed more, into more of a family man, I think it's safe to say. But in the same time, his children didn't know they were wealthy. Yeah. That's what you say in your book, is that... At a certain time, there's a big article in Fortune magazine right. that changes completely the thing because he was rather secretive about his wealth and things like that. And then suddenly they say yeah. he's the richest man in the world. At that point, that he becomes also an icon, a public figure. Public the, figure, yeah. 
and therefore the children are aware of this. No, exactly. That was that was definitely a turning point in his life. He professed not to like it. I mean, secretly, I think he came to enjoy the attention. I mean, he had to claim he didn't, but um, he made a big show. In fact, that you know he didn't like it, but something tells me he did, it wasn't too terrible for him. But it did it did change his life definitely. And you're right. Not only did the world not know how wealthy he was, his children, his sons didn't. And Gordon, his son, who's still alive at 88 in San Francisco, who was brought up with his brother, Paul Jr., recollected how when they heard about that article, Gordon's reaction was, holy mackerel, which was a very, you know, American American expression. He said, we didn't have any idea. These children didn't really follow him in the business, right? Because uh, one had uh, drug problems, the other one became more composer, a musician, right. another right. one died of stress because he was working yeah. but too yeah. much stress. So he wasn't very lucky. And then the son, Paul, who had this wife, beautiful wife, Talita, right, was right. a kind of myth in the Marrakesh house, you know, with right, the, right, with exactly. Rolling Stones and right, all that. Right, and right. then she dies of an overdose, right? And then there is the famous kidnapping of his first grandson, John Paul, like him, who right. was kidnapped in Italy. And then there right. was all this story that yeah. he didn't want to pay the ransom and... A lot of publicity and around that. Right. You no, know, there's a lot to unpack that. I don't know if you what you want me to talk about, but there, there are a lot of things. But all that's true, absolutely. Yeah. There was a series of sort of tragedy. You know, in the space of a few years, these series of tragedies befell the family. First was really the death of Talitha, and then very soon afterwards, his first son George died. Of it was a combination of drugs and stress, and then just really like six weeks later. Paul III, his grandson, was kidnapped. These things kind of started the narrative of the tragic dynasty that, you know, has been well reported and sort of followed the family to this day. And a lot of people still, you know, when the Getty name is mentioned, they sort of think tragedy. One of the things that I kind of tried to bring out of the book is, well, obviously, if they have had tragedy happen to them, I don't think it's accurate to call them a tragic dynasty. But in the main, most of them have ended up living, you know, very productive, creative, happy, rich lives. But undeniably, there's been great tragedy in the family. What you describe is that the son, Paul, his son, after a life of drugs and things, yeah. then he becomes yeah. a philanthropist. He yeah. lost some money to the National Gallery, and he changes his life. Ah. Unfortunately, his son mm -hmm. had a tragic accident, right. and he's yeah. Dies, then he died yeah. young. He talked yeah. about the fictitious mother, too, right. who was very close to him. Right. On the topic of Paul Jr. and his son, obviously, I think addiction is a hereditary thing, oftentimes in, in families. And I think there is must have been an addictive gene in, in, in the Getty family. A lot of them have been addicted to drugs. Some of them have been decimated by it, but, but a number of them, I think it's anything, have managed to rehabilitate themselves and go on to lead really productive lives. And an example of that is, as you're saying, Paul Jr., you know, for about 15 years, he was in a completely reclusive kind of dark state. And then he managed to come out of that. And like the last 15 years of his life, you know, were marvelous. And he, you know, became this great philanthropist. He bought this great estate Wormsley, in Buckinghamshire. He bought this marvelous yacht that he named it the Talitha G. And there are other members of the family who've also, you know, kind of come close to the edge with drugs, but have managed to rehabilitate themselves and, and then go on to do really wonderful things. He also had a son, Mark Getty, who is a brilliant mm -hmm. man. He made a Absolutely. fortune by France. Absolutely. He made his own fortune and um, he kind of revolutionized the world of images and the digital world. And, uh, you know, what he's done with Getty Images really is pretty incredible. At the end of the day, writing this book, there are some of the characters mm -hmm. that you like much. There are some episodes that you would like to tell that are particularly interesting in the yeah. book. Or... I found most of them quite intriguing and most of them I actually found likable. I mean, I've written a lot about dynasties in, in my career for various reasons. And usually in every dynasty, there's some sort of scoundrel, you could say, but I didn't find any scoundrels in, in the Getty family. I mean, some of them obviously have had misfortunes, but in the main, 
most of them seem to be, you know, pretty well-meaning people. But in terms of some of my favorite Gettys, I mean, there's Aileen, who is a sister of Mark. When she was around 20, she married one of Elizabeth Taylor's sons. But then kind of darkness kind of fell upon her. I mean, she also became addicted to drugs and she contracted HIV like in the mid 1980s, which was, you know, a time if you got HIV at that point, it was almost a death sentence. And, you know, there's one interesting, uh, in my research, I found in, in 1991, USA Today, one of the big new- newspapers, there was a headline of, about her that said, basically, Aileen Getty had been told by doctors she has six months to a year to live. That was 1991. Imagine reading a headline like that about yourself. Well, anyway, fast forward today, I mean, she's healthy, she's thriving, and she's really passionate about use, using her fortune to help combat climate change. And, you know, she's someone who just uh, really turned her life around in, in a good way. What I found interesting is pretty much all the grandchildren and great-grandchildren have gone in very different directions. Part of that is just geographically, you know, they live on four continents today, but also just in terms of their interests. Getty's first son, who was named George He's the one who died prematurely at age, I think, 48. But he had three daughters who were kind of nicknamed the Georgettes. And they're sort of the most private of all the Gettys. They do live in Southern California. Probably, you know, one of the leading conservationists in the world. But, you know, she wants absolutely no attention for it, no recognition. She wants to do this all kind of completely privately, which points out you know, one of the interesting things people might not realize about there have been a number of Gettys who've had these tragedies happen or had various reasons they've become very famous. Most of the Gettys are really quite private, is one thing I came to learn in this story, because they're, they're most Gettys you've never heard of, and that they prefer it that way, uh, to tell the truth, besides these kind of other high-profile Gettys. So they, these three granddaughters from, the, from J. Paul Getty's first son, then Paul Jr., his children, the five of them were all very interesting. The youngest one, Tara, was the son that Paul Jr. had with Talitha. Tara was three years old when Talitha died. You would have thought that would have set him off for a sad life. He's kind of, if they say, they're sort of the normal Getty, the happiest Getty. He lives most of the half the year in Africa, where he has an incredible refuge. He's an animal conservationist. He does really extraordinary things in animal conservation. And then he's a very passionate sailor. About the other half of the year, he lives around Saint-Tropez, and he has a series of boats and um, a lovely man. There is a son, as you said, that is still alive, that he sure. is mainly a composer, no? That's or, right, that's right, yeah. Did you talk to him? I've spoken to him over the years for magazine interviews. So I've interviewed him a number of times for magazine interviews. To be perfectly honest, when it came to this book, he was one of them that... Um, I didn't speak to, but I, I'd spoken to him a number of times for, for magazine interviews, so I'm knowledgeable to an extent about him. What did he uh, say uh, about his father? What he adored his father. He spoke very warmly about his father. He definitely um, has great affection for his father. And were all his children and grandchildren were sort of terrified by this old man who was so special? I mean... I don't think so. Even like I said, Gordon, when I spoke to him, he spoke very warmly about his father, and so did the grandchildren. As I said, they all spoke of him very affectionately. The business was sold. Mm -hmm. You don't have any business anymore, right? They're not anymore. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that really gave them the freedom to do what they wanted. As you say, the trust is still going, but I believe the way it, it works is when Gordon dies, the trust will terminate and all the principal will be divided up into the heirs. All these years, they've been very handsomely provided for, but they've had the freedom to kind of do what they want because they, they weren't tied to the, any one business. And um, the destiny of the grandson, uh, the one who was kidnapped, to John Paul, and then the fact that he was very ill for many years, and has that affected the family or...? Paul III, who was kidnapped. Yeah, that very much hangs over the family. You know, that was an incredibly traumatic event. It's continued, I think, to haunt some members of the family, understandably so. It was immensely traumatic, I think. And um, that's why I think a lot of them have remained, tried to remain very private as they could be. And um, it's a sadness that still does hang over the family in certain ways.
They are from California, obviously. Mm-hmm. But the old man lived in England because he wasn't very happy in Italy. This is what you say. He wasn't right. so well accepted in Italy. Instead, he found himself well accepted in England. But still, many members of the family have Italy as their second home, right? They, especially in Tuscany. But, yeah. And they got there every year. Right, and right. Mark Getty in particular, I think he's very interested in right. this image, right. uh, the Palio di Siena. Yeah, no, it's funny. They're, they're all very drawn to Italy. They're very much all Italophiles. I mean, most of them still go back to Italy for at least some portion of the summer, you know, even after the trauma of the kidnapping. I think they stayed away for a couple of years after the kidnapping, but they just adore Italy so much. Most, most of them go back every summer. So altogether, you had uh, fun. I mean, was it interesting for you to write? The editor <laughs> has suggested you to do the book. Yeah. Was right. I mean, are you pleased I, with the book? Yeah, I mean, it was challenging, but fascinating. There were different parts of the, the process. I mean, I was able to start it just before the pandemic, and so I was able to get access to certain archives at the Getty Center in Los Angeles, I was able to look at some of J. Paul Getty's diaries and correspondence. And in fact, I don't know if you re- remember that these parts of the book, but there were some letters that J. Paul Getty and his wives kind of wrote to each other that I think were so touching and that sort of illuminated to me that kind of showed me he wasn't that sort of this mean, cold character necessarily that, that he has been portrayed as. And then, you know, the fun of it was just trying to connect the dots between all these different people and all the people, like I said, they, they just um, kind of associated with so many interesting people. It was a, interesting to try to piece together the whole picture. What did the family say about your book? Well, I've gotten notes from several of them so far, and they've actually been very positive about it. I mean, it's, it's small. I, you know, there are many I have, I have not heard from, but at least a few have written me some very nice notes saying that they were happy with the book, which I was happy to receive. And how is it going in America? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we've gotten very good reviews. I mean, the Times gave it a very good review. Uh, National Public Radio had a very good segment on it. The book punctures certain myths about the family. Most people, especially because, you know, there was that movie that came out a few years ago that Ridley Scott directed All the Money in the World. And then there was a TV series directed by Danny Boyle called Trust. And both of those, I think they were very entertaining film projects, but I don't necessarily think they were very true. And they really played up the idea that J. Paul Getty was this incredibly mean man. And so that's the sort of image that sort of solidified and it's kind of the public imagination. And so some of the reviewers of my book were actually sort of surprised that, you know, J. Paul Getty wasn't such a nasty man after all. Some people still find that kind of hard to believe. Also, just the idea that everything about the family is so tragic. You know, when I sort of document that, in fact, you know, most of them have been productive people, it's come as a sort of surprise to um, certain readers or reviewers. But most of the reviewers of it reviews have been quite positive. What you say about the way he built up his fortune, yeah. right? Also, the financial world has found your book interesting because it's not only Vanity Fair's saga, I mean, with right. the character. Right and a lot of anecdotes and details. Ultimately, all this is known because he was a great businessman, right? Absolutely. No, he made this incredible fortune. Yeah, I mean, very ind- very independently. I mean, he, he kind of... Um, He's like, alone. He, yeah, the- yeah, he was kind of a one-man band in a way. He was never kind of an establishment guy, as you alluded to before. I mean, he sort of outbested like the Rockefeller family and Standard Oil and a number of the so-called seven sisters in the oil business just by being fast and smart. And from your book, what does it come out? How was his relationship in business? There is a particular that we didn't say. He knew many languages. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Including which again, th- Arabic, so that he could talk. Yeah. Which again, I think is pretty unusual for an American, especially from the West Coast, you know, of that from 1900. I don't think there were many 20-year-olds from California who were learning six languages, including Arabic. He had a real curiosity about the world, and that propelled him forward, I believe. And is the family still interested in the Getty Foundation, in the museum? 
which is obviously now a double museum, because at the beginning it wasn't so well received, but nowadays it's one of the major attractions oh, no. in the city. Absolutely. Of no, it's a cultural gem, not just for California, but, you know, for the world, you know, it, it's a great cultural asset. But, you know, interesting enough, the way J. Paul Getty structured that in his will and his bequest, family was never involved in the running of that museum. I mean, some of them have taken interest in it, and some of them have been on the board for various points, but they've never had a hand in running it or managing it. I mean, he made very clear that he wanted to be professionally run. And it's interesting, you know, like Mark Getty, like the English Gettys, and Paul Getty, obviously, took a big interest in the National Gallery in London. And that kind of became, you know, Paul Getty Jr. made that incredible bequest, you know, that saved it more or less. But the Getty Center in California, I think the family are all very proud of it, no doubt about that. But they've never had a hand in the running of it. He never went to America. Yeah. So he never saw it himself. You think this was his legacy that Ab- he wanted to? Absolutely. Because this is the key thing. He believed that art was a civilizing force. I think for many years, this was his idea to leave his personal fortune to this museum. And he was planning it in his head for decades. You know, he had bought this land in Malibu and most of the art that he was buying from like 1940s onward was sort of shipped directly to the site, even though the museum wouldn't be built. He started the actual designing of it I kind of in the late 1960s. And, you know, it's interesting. He planned it all remotely. And now we all work remotely. He'd have people in California take Super 8 movies, and then it would be flown from Los Angeles, you know, to London, you know, 6,000 miles. And also, you know, they, he micromanaged it, but you know, he would, they would send him plans, they would send him photographs, and he would inspect them all 6,000 miles away and make this revision of Sutton Place and then send it back to them. But then when it opened, yes, uh, you know, it was early January of 1974, and as I wrote, you know, it really, by the cultural kind of intelligentsia, was very harshly received, mostly because this was kind of the high noon of modernism. And the building itself was this, people saw this, you know, this colorful Roman villa. They thought it was kitsch and camp. And so a lot of the, you know, the, the kind of cultural elite greeted it with a lot of scorn. But, you know, as the years went by, it's become a beloved site. And then, of course, then years later, they commissioned Richard Meyer to design that incredible campus, you know, at Santa Monica, which is really the main Getty Museum now. But, you know, between the two um, centers, I mean, I think they've been gifts to the world. And also something really worth noting is no one has ever had to pay a penny in admission fees. Admission has been completely free since the doors opened now to millions and millions of people. And, um, you know, I think what a gift that is. And this is, at the end of the day, what he will be remembered for. I think so. I think so. I mean, the the Getty Gift Center is an amazing gift to the world, in my mind. When you finished the book, you had sympathy for him? I did, actually. I I quite enjoyed him, actually. I mean, I thought he's been misportrayed in a lot of ways. I actually do quite like him. And are they today a united family? I mean, are they a close family? You know, not every one of them, but in the main, most of them are very tight-knit, I think, and surprisingly so, especially considering, as I said, they live on four different continents today. Most of them are surprisingly close-knit. What's interesting to me that's come through is this mischaracterization in the public mind. Can you just summarize, perhaps, the mischaracterizations that you've identified in the book of this remarkable and rather advanced forward-thinking and wide-ranging man? Well, I think you sort of covered it. The only myth that I think is really true is his cheapness. I mean, that's for sure. But otherwise, I think he was, one, he had a sense of humor. He was actually quite funny. And he was very social and he liked people. And he did come to like his family very much. And he was a, you know, a very philanthropic man. 
you sort of change the image of uh, him mm. and also of the family. In big families, let's not mention the Kennedys, you know, which Mark. is the most horrible Mark. example in the sense that they have real huge tragedies, right? right? right. But uh, sometimes in large families where there is a lot of wealth, yeah. uh, these things happen. But yeah, ultimately, so. what you say is that um, that's a wrong image. First of all, it means that he wasn't so mean. Second of yeah. all, also the others, I mean, his uh, children and grandchildren, one way or the other, he achieved also very positive things. Yeah, I think that says a lot. Just right at the beginning, James, you were talking about the source of his wealth. Was there not also a drill bit or something like that that he had a a patent on that made a lot of enduring money, whether they found oil, that he had particular ways of drilling for oil. I mean, he was a very inventive man. Did you find out anything new about that side of him from looking at the archives? Well, as I was saying before, just his study of the science of petroleum geology, which was not a pretty new science, and he really embraced that much more than some of the wildcatters of his generation. His real big fortune was, you know, his finding this huge deposit in the neutral zone. He commissioned, he said, the finest geologist he knew to do an aerial survey, um, kind of following petroleum geology. He had a hunch, but then this petroleum geologist kind of confirmed that your hunch is right, probably. So I don't know if you, that's kind of the main thing I would have to say. What kind of women he liked, you know, I mean, he was yeah. a womanizer. He married many yeah. women. Mainly young he women. lived with them. Yeah, and mainly very young women. I mean, women. what they, you they... said is that he loved to fall in love, and then it, it was more difficult for him to make a family, to create a family life. But which yeah. kind of women he fell in love with? Yeah. Why did he marry so many times? I couldn't exactly tell you that. All these women clearly kind of enchanted him. I think he felt trapped in these marriages. And, you know, as soon as they had a child... That was part of it. He sort of, um, I think maybe he just needed to have his freedom back or something. But all these women seem to be very vivacious, very clever, very pretty, very young. As I said, it's really worth noting that he remained very close friends with all of them. If I am not wrong, there is one of his wives that was from a wealthy or quite important family. German, yeah. And they didn't like him at all, right? Well, that's true. And yeah. at the end of the day, he punished yeah. the son who he had yeah. with his wife, saying, you that's, don't need my yeah. money because you have yeah. your mother's money. So right. who yeah. was this woman? Can you okay. tell us a little yeah. bit more yeah. about yeah. this? Yeah. yeah, her first name was Edolfine. Everyone called her Fini. Um, her surname was Helmley. Her father was a very wealthy German industrialist. Yes. And he met her, saw her, I think, when he was in, I believe, Berlin at a hotel. And she was all of 17 at the time. I think Getty probably was well, in his mid-30s at the time. And he was kind of besotted with her. And she was, she was with her parents. And so her father, Dr. Hemley, this German industrialist, was very stern and did not approve of J. Paul Getty from the start. But J. Paul Getty romanced Beanie, and she fell in love with him. She convinced her parents to let them get married. So she goes off, the 17 year old, to Los Angeles. And then, in typical Getty fashion, as soon as they get there, J. Paul Getty basically just like deposits 17 year old Beanie at his parents' house. And then he goes back to work. And Beanie at the time, like, barely spoke English. And she felt very lonely, but they conceived this child, Ronald. And from the start, even before Ronald was born, Feeney was feeling very lonely. And so she wanted to go back to Germany for the birth of the child. So this is 1929. So this happens. And but J. Paul Getty agrees to meet her in Germany, in Berlin, for the birth of the child, just as he's about to leave in October 1929, the stock market crashes. So his departure is delayed. He's able to get to the hospital, I think just in the nick of time for Ronald, his second son, to be born. But then the Dr. Hamley is just, from the start, very opposed against this marriage. So he sort of presses his daughter 
he says, you know, it, to Jay Bulgetti, if you can't, because Dede wa- basically does not want to go back to California. So um, Dr. Helmley says, if you're not going to live here, you know, you have to get divorced. And so this was the one divorce, the one business deal in a way Jay Bulgetti lost because Dr. Helmley was a very tough operator. And so apparently he exacted a very high financial settlement. Jay Bulgetti has said that it's the one deal that basically he got the lesser of. And so that did provoke some bitterness, not necessarily against Beanie, but against Dr. Hemley. And at the time, Dr. Hemley was so wealthy. So when the next year, when the, this was when the, when the Getty Trust was written, his feeling was Dr. Hemley so wealthy, he can take care of Ronald. What no one anticipated, of course, is the war came. Dr. Hemley was a Catholic. He was anti-Hitler. Uh, his fortune was seized. And so Ronald, um, even though his maternal grandmother did give him millions of dollars later, he was on a much lower financial par than his brothers. Although Ronald's children, he had four children, they are included in the trust. But basically the trust skipped Ronald, which did put him on a lower financial par than his brothers for, for his whole life. That's a great story about one of the four wives. Uh, do you have great stories about uh, some of the others? Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite wives, there's Anne. Anne Rourke was her maiden name. She was the fourth wife. She was the only wife that produced a full pair of siblings. That, that, would, that would be Paul Jr. and Gordon. And she had a bit of a career as a silent movie actress and a budding starlet you know, in the 1920s. And um, she and Paul Getty, I think, met at one of these places like the Brown Derby or something, and they immediately um, were, were attracted to each other. Feeney hadn't been finalized yet, so he was still legally married. So it was a bit of scandal that Jay Bulgetti was dating someone, especially another younger woman. So he basically moved Feeney to New York, and they kind of had a long... And I, this is in the book. I published some letters that Feeney wrote to him when she was basically being kind of a kept woman in New York when he was in Los Angeles. And um, she was a very vivacious woman. What about at the end of his life? He had a few, I think. I mean, there were a few last mistress. But the the woman I think was probably closest to him, I wrote about her in the book, her name was Robina Lund. She was originally Scottish, and she had started off as his lawyer. And they had a romance until the end of his life. And she's written a couple of memoirs about J. Paul Getty herself. She's still alive. I spoke to her. She's um, actually a very active woman, um, still doing legal work in Aberdeenshire. But they remain very close till the end. But they never married. No, no. Well, he, there's a quote. There's one of my favorite quotes in the book. He said, um, shortly after his fifth divorce, a reporter asked him, are you going to get married again? And he said, it's like, if you've flown a plane and crashed five times, you better give up flying. You know, it's too dangerous. And he likened, so he said, if you've gotten five divorces, it's too dangerous to get married again. Okay, thank you for that. Alan L. Can interviews.